Okay, so um, everybody, welcome to our uh, June 17, 2015 meeting of the New York City Voter Assistance Advisory Committee. Uh, do I hear a motion to the meeting? Second. All in favor? Okay. First item is approval of our minutes from May 13th, 2015. Um, are there any comments, corrections, adjustments? One thing. Um, Sabrina was not here. Oh, sorry. So noted. Uh, with, that, with that correction, uh, do I have a motion to approve? Hmm. I have a motion to approve. Okay, thank, thanks. Second? All right, all in favor? All right. All right. Um, so, um, everybody welcome. Um, I guess the, uh, the, um, First uh, item is uh, the report of the back chair. That's me. So um, uh, I guess what I'll report on is actually the progress of our NYC votes um, uh, technology. Um, as um, this most of, some of you actually haven't heard this before, um, this is that we have so we've been working on a public-private partnership to use technology to uh, make voting as easy and convenient as as possible for people using all the tools and best practices from the web and from mobile. So we did this public private partnership to embark on a mission to make it possible for people to find out who's on their ballot, to research on their candidates, um, engage with the candidates on their social uh, platforms, to be able to um, engage with your social media on your social platforms, um, to be able to see who's endorsing the candidate, find out what the candidate's done before, um, and to be able to actually support the candidate uh, both by endorsement and also by making a contribution. Um, the, um, the tool will also help people find out where to vote, how to vote, to frequently asked questions. Uh, it's going to be available on your, on your smartphones and on your web and, and anything that's available via the web. Um, so the first part of this is actually a, a voter con a candidate contribution tool um, to really support the, the um, campaign finance board's um, effort to uh, increase small donors in uh, municipal elections, to shift power away from special interests and to support um, and give more power to small donors who can then be potentially eligible for the 61 map that the campaign finance board provides. And um, I am really pleased to, to say that um, in uh, a week from today, we expect to have that platform go live for candidates. And shortly thereafter, we'll be rolling up the, um, the, the voter piece of it in stages. Um, so we're very excited about that. And I really, really want to thank um, all the folks at the Campaign Finance Board, from legal to audit to um, candidate services, who have been so instrumental in making this happen, as well as everybody in back who has been been very supportive and helpful in the whole process. Um, so I think that's my only update. Okay. Um, I, apologize, I apologize for being late. Um, I Tonight we're going to talk all about youth and the youth vote, but I guess I'm going to report on one thing about the youth vote that's exciting, and then I'm going to step back and talk about some things that are maybe not related to that. Um, at last uh, month's uh, public hearing, we heard from uh, Mark Faber, Favor, I'm mispronouncing his name, I'm sorry, um, about a legislative initiative to allow uh, 16 and 17 year olds to pre-register. And I'm happy to report that that bill had been introduced by Assemblyman Brian Kavanaugh in the state legislature, and that has actually been passed by the Assembly and has uh, moved to the state Senate. And uh, uh, Governor Cuomo actually mentioned it in particular as one of his top uh, voting reforms for this year's legislative agenda. So that you know that's very favorable. So you know that will be very helpful. Um, what it allows is uh, people who, when they reach their 16th birthday or 17th birthday, to register uh, to vote ahead of time, and so that when you turn 18, you will automatically be registered. So it's, you know it's a very exciting uh, way to get people. Uh, the youth engaged and uh, registered automatically. Um, I have some more mundane reporting from the Campaign Finance Board. Since our 
uh, last meeting, the we had the certification deadline to join the campaign public financing campaign program, and that happened on June 10th, and we received over 220 certifications of people who wanted to join the program. So we're in for a very busy election season. Um, uh, we have also uh, have announced our debate program sponsors uh, at an official press conference on the City Hall steps last Thursday afternoon. Uh, we have really, really great debate partners this year, and we actually got really a lot of coverage of our, our press conference. Uh, we have three debate sponsor groups, and uh, you know, the list of when the debates are is available on our website, and uh, it was passed out as a, uh, for everyone here. Uh, the first group is led by CBS 2 News, uh, WCBS News Radio 880, 1010 Winds, Common Cause New York, and El Diario La Prensa. The second group, uh, led by New York One, New York One Noticias, WNYC, the Citizens Committee for New York City, Citizens Union, Gothamis, the Hispanic Federation, and Transportation Alternatives. And the third group is uh, led by WNBC TV, Telemundo 47, and the Wall Street Journal. So uh, we look forward, forward to a really, really exciting debate season. The kickoff debate event will be on uh, with the first mer mayoral Democratic uh, primary debate on Wednesday, October, uh, August 21st at Historic Town Hall, um, ending up with a the final general election debate for mayor at the uh, Saturday Night Live studios at 30 Rockefeller Plaza. So very, very exciting. Uh, debate season. And uh, also today is the submission deadline for our print voter guide statements, uh, and candidates are busily submitting those statements, which will be uh, printed and mailed to every household with a registered voter in the city of New York, um, printed and translated into five languages this year, English, Spanish, uh, Korean, Chinese, and Bengali. Um, and distributed throughout the city uh, to people who need them. And we are also in the midst of getting ready for our video voter guide. And to that end, I'd like to introduce a new staff member, uh, Ms. Drew Gibson, who is joining us to help with the video voter guide program to produce it. Uh, Ms. Gibson is a seasoned live television professional. She's worked with a lot of programs that you've heard of, like Good Morning America, Regis and Kathy Lee, The Marriage Rep, and she will be responsible for managing our video voter guide workflow, the schedule, the pre-production, the production and post-production, and will be there on site to handle all the things that happen as the filming occurs. Um, we are have already started to accept scripts from the candidates, and June 26th is the deadline for those video voter guide scripts. And then the candidates will also begin to be able to schedule their tapings via a web uh, application that is on, um, that all the candidates have been sent who are registered have been sent links to register for. Okay, and that is my speech. So I'm going to turn it over to Anita. Great. Good evening, everyone. So, um, as Amy started, she said that this meeting was going to be youth focused, and I just wanted to share with you why that is so. Uh, we're very committed to the youth vote and making sure that the younger population understand what their rights are, understand what the deadlines are. Uh, not only that we share with them what um, some of the issues are, but for them to communicate what are the issues for them and to make sure that those are communicated across the board and how do we communicate that. So we wanted to really have an, an opportunity for conversation with some of our partners who, are, who have youth populations, who serve the youth population. So you will hear from a few of our partners today, whether it's programming or whether it's advocacy and legislation, and they'll share you know, some of the things that they're working on. And we're hoping that as a group as well, what our chair likes is for us to really have conversation and have dialogue. So it's not just going to be conversations going one way, but that we really want it to be a two-way dialogue. So feel free to join in the conversation. Uh, one of the things that I wanted to report on is that the Department of Education 
they were not able to join us. They are one of our partners, but they are also covered under the Young Adult Voter Registration Act. And they sent in a very brief testimony, and, I, and I'll just highlight some of it, because what it calls for is for them to distribute voter registration forms to all graduating high school seniors. So what they have reported, and Valerie, you might already know this, um, they said that they have worked with the Board of Elections, the New York City Board of Elections, to obtain over 80,000 forms this year that were hand-delivered by courier to each high school citywide. They also liaised with principals and their support teams to help them execute their responsibilities to distribute the forms to graduating seniors. So we will continue to work with them because that's not where it ends. What we realize that even with this law is that it's important for students to know what it looks like before they receive it. They, it's important for them to know how they're supposed to fill it out. Sometimes they need assistance in filling it out. And what does that mean? So while there, there isn't any mandated curriculum right now to make that happen, uh, we do have some wonderful partners in the room today who I'm sure are gonna talk about how we can make that exciting for the students. Um, so you, you'll you hear more about that in the DOE saying that they are committed to working with us in the fall as well. So they're doing this before the, the students are out of school. Um, I'm also really excited to introduce to you, if you remember from last year, we had a street team that the CFB brought on. And the, the, concept, the concept of the street team is that in the summer is our only opportunity to have access to so many people at so many times because New, New Yorkers are out and they are about and we want to be able to try to connect with them. And it's very hard for us to do that alone, so we're able to hire really bright, intelligent young people who have keen insight on sometimes where to go and how to engage their peers and to help us to continue to leverage our partnership. So what I'd like to do is introduce them to you. Today I have three of them who are here with us. Uh, the first is Frangel Basora. He attends Columbia University. Um, Mr. Basora was worked with the Obama Organizing Fellow at program and worked as a legislative intern for assembly member Linda Rosenthal. He has wonderful, wonderful stories of working in the field. He is a real field grassroots um, uh, volunteer. <laughs> and we're happy to have him working with us this summer. Also, we have Jerry Nicole Javier. Jerry is graduated from Fordham University and has worked in community organizing for organizations such as the Latino Commission on AIDS and the Hope Count 2012. And I'll say, you know, there was a lot of fight where so many organizations wanted Jerry, so we were happy that we were able to get her down. <laughs> uh, and then we also have George Ocasio. George graduated from Syracuse University just recently. He worked, he was an intern at the office of Senator Charles Schumer and we're really delighted to have Charles as part of this team. You'll meet others as there, there are two more uh, who aren't able to join us today. Uh, but thank you all very much. Thank you for being here. So I do not want to spend too much more time talking because I think you're gonna hear some wonderful things from other people. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce my colleague, Cheyenne Sapp, who is our Youth Voter Coordinator. And Cheyenne is really gonna give her perspective on what she sees and hears while she is out in the field working. She is a silent storm and <laughs> we'll hear a lot from her now. Hello. Good evening, everyone. Oh, 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 I'm sorry. I know, you did. Yes, I did go out of order. I said, did I go out of order? I didn't give you the signal. Okay, great, okay. right. thank you. So, Cheyenne, you stay right there. Well, let's just tell you that we're going to break the flow. Yeah. Oh, okay. Okay. Oh, cool. Okay, okay, ready? <laughs> good evening, everyone. Uh, good evening, committee members and Chair Chen. 
It's a pleasure to be here today to present on my insight from the field um, and the work that I've done over the past year and what we plan to do in the continuing year for youth outreach. Um, as you, of course, know, this is a huge election year, so our focus is getting youth to know what this election year is about and to really understand the importance of the local elections and how it affects them directly in their day-to-day -day lives. So I thought it would be important to share some experience from the field, including our goals for the year, um, as well as field observations from programming and recommendations. Um, so to outline some of our goals for this year is to increase youth voter turnout in the upcoming general election by 1%. Um, and our research shows that with our current programming, we can reach 1% uh, of youth voters through our partnerships and our social media outreach, so this is attainable. And 1% equals to about 15,000 youth voters. Um, so we also want to enhance our social media presence, which will be a very important tool in increasing voter turnout. I don't need to tell you how important social media is in reaching youth populations. So um, using our social media and partner, partner collaborations to um, create content that is youth specific and also to um, promote the work that we do in our partnerships and events and programming. So some of my field observations that I'm very eager to share. Um, I have one of my partners here, Mr. James Rodriguez from Leland High School, who is very important in um, helping me to reach this outreach, as well as the um, administ I'm sorry, ACS, which is Administrative Children's Services, New York Institute of Technology, from Summer, I love it. and um, we have the YMCA. So um, just to go through my field observations, Perception from the youth has been very interesting. So of course we know that apathy is sweeping uh, the youth population, which is why they are 4%, or we are 4% youth voter turnout. So um, what I've learned from perception is um, there's a lack of exposure, there's a lack of understanding, and there's a lack of education that surrounds youth. So in terms of lack of exposure, a lot of them have said that they get pushed into adulthood at 18. They get, you know, they graduate from high school. They have no idea what it means to be a registered voter. They graduate high school and they leave, and it's up to them to figure it out. So of course, if they don't see the importance of figuring it out, then they're not going to. So we want to make sure that we do these workshops and trainings that goes to the students before they graduate high school and even before then to expose them to the material that um, they're going to need to know once they graduate. Also, lack of understanding, they don't have a, a comprehension, a good comprehension of the importance and significance of voting, or they have very little comprehension of the roles of elected officials, candidates, and um, local government. And lastly, lack of education and miseducation. They don't understand what it means to be a voter, and they don't know their role in local government. And then most importantly, many believe that they're automatically registered when they turn 18, which we know is not true. So some of the workshops that I have been doing have been brief and engaging workshops that use interactive discussion-based material to um, encourage them to critically think about what it means to be a voter and also to create personal connections between themselves and their community. So I, in each of the workshops, I ask them to answer questions like, what are the issues that affect youth? What are the issues that are important to you? How is your community or family affected by youth and voting? and how will your future be affected by voting. So I did a survey of Lehman High School senior class um, with the help of Mr. Rodriguez, and I surveyed 60 students from the senior class. And what I learned from um, the survey is that the top le legislative items that affect you are um, online voting and voter registration. 29% said that that was their number one legislative item, as well as allowing same-day voting and pre-registration at 20% equal. From the workshop, 50% of them said that they were more likely to register to vote after the workshop. And top issues affecting the youth, 28% said minimum wage, 24% said jobs, and 19% said stop at risk. So um, those were the results from the survey, which were very uh, helpful. And I do plan to conduct additional surveys with the larger population as we get closer to the election cycle. Um, some of my recommendations are, what I have found is that youth take in information differently from our traditional methods of outreach. So using a social media based approach as the primary tool for voter outreach for youth is key. Um, 
Also, the use of the NYC Votes app, which is going to be great because I've been promoting it as a one-stop shop for voting. So they've been complaining um, or giving me feedback that, <laughs> that voting information is all over the place. They have to go here to find out about a candidate. They have to go to another place to find out how to register. And then they have to go even elsewhere if they want to get involved. So this is a way to bring everything in, and that's how I've been marketing it. So they're really excited about that. Um, and also education, so using an issue-based approach to um, get them to understand what voting means to them. Um, and an issue-based approach is used in the workshops that I facilitate, and it incorporates things like trivia, um, and they're always super um, surprised to find out that New York State is 43rd in voter participation. That's the trivia question they always get wrong. And then that they're 4% in um, youth voter turnout for the city. So um, our plans for over the summer, we're going to work with the street team that you just, you just met to um, continue our outreach efforts and to focus on building partnerships with community and youth organizations, as well as building our social media well. Um, so now I want to turn it over to our partners. Uh, I just want to give the floor to a few of you partners that have been really instrumental in helping to um, help with our outreach and also have received some of the tools that we offer for you. So I'll start with. Um, Can I ask a question? Of course. So, uh, how do you define you? How do I find? Define. 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 Um, that's a very interesting question. I guess it's best defined as 18 to 29 in terms of the voting demographic. But if we're building a voting culture, which means that we're building a population of voters that are coming into the government and, and becoming adults, then we need to start earlier. So I think using high school and our strength with the Department of Education as a, a, a way to get to them is best. Also with the Department of Youth and Community Development, going to where they are and where they're learning about history, now is the perfect time to capitalize on them. As I said, if you wait until the very end, um, there's not a, a if I don't come in to do workshops, people don't. So, you know, I've, I've been to about 15 schools. I go maybe once a month. And um, most of the teachers have said that I've been the only one that has approached them about coming in to do something of this sort. So if that uh, opportunity to register youth is not presented, then it's never presented. So if you wait until the very last minute, then you lose out on a huge population. But if you incorporate that into curriculum, um, so that they learn throughout their high school career, or even leading up to the last two years of the high school career, which is a still very pertinent time to catch them, is the, the best approach. And um, so there are one and a half million uh, people. Are these registered voters, or are these just a total population? One and a half uh, total population. Okay. And how many of those are registered? No. We're looking at statistics on how many people actually were registered in 2009. And just one other question. Yes. So when you say you want to reach a 1%, which is 15,000 people, how are you going to count? Well, tracking is very um, much of a challenge. Mm -hmm. But um, using the Department of Education, who sends out the 80,000 forms, those are easy, I guess, to track if we really implement a good program. Um, and then also through our other partnerships, we could um, figure out ways to track. So tra if, even if we can't code the forms, to, you know, from the Board of Elections, we can still figure out a system for tracking. So tracking not only distribution, but then also how many we collect and how many we get back. I mean, I one, the one thing that we can track is, you know, one, you know, uh, when the people that you touch, you know, the, the registration forms that we get from those people, um, and also, you know, through our social media and yes, interactions. Definitely. And we'll be promoting this online voter registration. Mm -hmm. So that is another way to track how many people click the link through us or through our partners. Yeah, we, we can talk after. I can track for you the, the number of any age group that works. Oh, wonderful. So that's, mm -hmm. we can look at that number now and then we can look at it after. Yeah. Great. Oh, great. I have a question. Yes. I have a couple of questions, um, The law only mandates graduating seniors, but unfortunately, a lot of people are 18 and are not graduating. So I was wondering how you reach, are you trying to reach them? And then this other question goes to students who are not in 
traditional high school students who are in GED program? Yes. Do, what efforts do you make? Because there are a lot of students. Yes, absolutely. So there are a lot of students across the city that are not in traditional high school programs, but the Department of Education covers um, a majority of the public high schools. So um, whether it be a GED program or alternative program, the Department of Education does survey a lot of those schools. So when they say that the 80,000 went out, the 80,000 went out to all of those schools. Including the GED programs, like at Mega has like a large, huge GED program. Correct. Yeah. So um, as far as I know, it goes to GED programs as well, but I can double check to be sure of that. But um, in addition to that, what we do is that's where it's important to establish partnerships on my own. Um, with GED programs and alternative high schools across the city because if I can't reach them through, uh, say, the Department of Education, then I have to reach them individually. So um, I have been doing outreach. Like, I've been working with um, ACS, and they reach a lot of GED students, uh, students that are pursuing alternate degree, degrees. So that's another way to reach them. I would also add that Cheyenne and Stewart also work hand in hand and Stewart really monitors the local law 29 so the agency based uh, voter engagement uh, partnerships that we have so for instance in some of the other populations even those uh, people who have been victims of like incarceration or formerly incarcerated mm -hmm. so we have partnerships with the Department of Corrections and the Department of Probation and they have school programs that are based there as well so there are partnerships and, and programs that are worked out through those as well and, and definitely you will hear more from ACS and the, and the work that we do with them uh, and I will say that because of the work that Cheyenne does, um, I asked her once if she identifies as youth. <laughs> <laughs> and she identifies as young adult. Uh, and for that reason, we've started to really brand it that way, youth and young adult, to cover that wide range of where people feel they actually fall. Mm -hmm. What do you so I will bring up, um, I guess, your vote. Hi. Hi. Well, thank you all so much for having me. Um, my name is Patricia Hart, and I work for CareVote, the Center for Voting and Democracy. I'm a project director, and we're based in Washington, D.C. Um, I wanted to talk to you all a little bit about um, something that recently happened in our hometown of Tacoma Park, which is a suburb of Washington, D.C. Um, they have recently passed 16-year-old voting in municipal elections. Yeah. Um, and it's the first city in the United States to do so. Um, so our project, Promote Our Vote, which was launched in 2013, was um, a big help to getting this policy um, proposed and passed through the city council. Um, I want to give you a little bit of an overview of our program and then go into the uh, details about the policy and some of the ways that it's likely to affect the demographic that actually votes in the Park. Um, so the program Promote Our Vote um, is grounded in the belief that voting is a fundamental right in a democracy. And we have four primary goals, which are to um, increase voter participation in cities, um, protecting voter access in all elections, um, expanding a conversation about um, expanding suffrage rights to a few populations, and building a mo movement for a constitutional right to vote. Um, we work with community leaders to pass what we call right to vote resolutions and pro-voting ordinances. Um, our right to vote resolutions, they um, generate a conversation within the community about um, what voting means and what communities need to do to um, protect the right to suffrage. Um, they also voice support for um, various pro-voting policies and practices. And one of the most important things that they do is they set up um, pro-voting task forces, which do um, similar work as um, the Voter Assistance Advisory Committee. Um, they look at ways to improve elections locally, um, to expand suffrage, um, to uh, institute practices that would get more people um, registered to vote and voting on a regular basis. Um, so, we recently had an incredible success in Tacoma Park, which is our home city, so we were very happy about this. Um, we passed a right to vote resolution in tandem with a, um, with a charter amendment, which gave 16-year-olds the right to vote, 
It also expanded um, access in apartment buildings. Um, so candidates could actually go into apartment buildings and um, talk to people who live in apartment buildings as opposed to just houses. Um, generally, there are very divergent populations that live in these um, different areas. Um, we also instituted um, same-day registration, um, early voting, and we extended suffrage rights to people um, with felony convictions directly after they exit prison. Um, so, 16-year-old um, voting was one of the bigger, um, was one of the things that passed that got a lot of publicity because Pickleman Park is the four first city to institute such a policy in the United States. Um, through our research, we found that the earlier a, a young person passed their first vote, the more likely they are to habitually vote in the future. So, um, there was a study done in Denmark that showed, um, so if I turned, um, when, if I turned 18, um, the month of the election, was able to vote right away. That I'm more likely to vote than somebody who turned 22 months before, and, and somebody who turned, I'm sorry, 18, and somebody who turned 18 two months before the election is more likely to vote um, habitually than somebody who turned 18 three months before. Um, there is a change every single month. Every single month that you do not vote, you're less likely to vote in the future. Um, we found that um, early voting, which is, I'm sorry, youth voting, um, which is actually an international movement, is um, is a way to um, keep people engaged as they age. Um, they're also more likely to vote for the first time because people who are not yet 18 have roots in their communities and they are also taking civics classes, which primes them for um, voting. They are also surrounded by um, generally an affirmative community that, um, that can create a culture that gets more um, youth out to vote. Um, there are other organizations that are working on this issue. For example, there is uh, Vote 17, which is based in Lowell, Massachusetts, and they have um, they have gone uh, they had to go through a longer process. They actually had to go get approval through their state legislature to um, allow a referendum within Lowell to lower the voting age. But um, we expect several other cities to um, look at this as a way to um, increase. Um, increase voter engagement and a way to increase uh, just the amount of youth that vote um, from the time they turn 18 to, um, to the time they get older. Um, so the things that we offered Take Home Apart was um, legal analysis. We also offered electoral research and um, communications assistance. Can I ask a question? I mean, I happen to know a lot about Chicago Park. My sister used to live there. So I, I, I was wondering, I mean, it's a very, very it's a diverse a, community. Exactly. So I was, I was wondering how you're, what in, how are you doing about, what are you doing about education? I mean, so now you have, people have this new right, but I mean, what are you doing to educate 16 year olds that they can now do this? I mean, so we, um, we did a right to vote uh, resolution and a um, charter amendment in tandem. Like we passed them within the same week. So um, the resolution basically sets up a task force that, that looks to ways to um, educate young people or people within the community. So um, there, it should be ready. I think the task force will be up and running in the next two months. Um, and then they will be making proposals to the city council of ways to educate young people and people within the community. Um, a lot of public awareness is certainly necessary. How's the, uh, the building access? Did that pass, and it did how, pass. how does that work? What was there a problem? What was the problem beforehand? Um, I believe that they had to change their zoning code. Sometimes it's like a police code. Um, there are often uh, candidates just do not have um, access to apartment buildings um, in cities, um, and sometimes it falls under different um, laws within the city. Um, and so a lot of candidates were seeing that they were only able to speak to people in houses. And that demographic, those who are settled on homeowners, is very different than um, the demographic that you'll find in apartment buildings. And they really wanted to reach you know, younger people or racial minorities or people who um, are more likely to live in apartment buildings. And they um, found that this was actually a very helpful policy to do so. So they can't be, they can't be removed if they're campaigning. They um, actually have to um, set up an appointment. Like, I think it's uh, a month in advance. Um, the apartment building will let people know, you know, if they're there. They can basically, you know, knock on doors, but they're not allowed to, you know, cause any public disturbances. There are um, a lot of restrictions on what they can do in terms of like, infringing upon people's privacy and what have you. What 
brother and his family living in Tacoma Park. Your brother does? Yeah. Oh, we have a lot of connections. It's a, it's terrific. So, this is a, a when is this going to go into effect? When's the first election? That, um, um, this I believe it will be um, this coming election. And um, how do you think participation is going to be? Yeah, I think it's going to be very high. We saw a lot of interest in the um, community. So something that was really sad about the Gullah Park is we found um, statistics that showed in the last municipal election only uh, around 30 people voted who were um, between 18 and 29. 30 people. 30 people out of the population? What's the population? Uh, it's a huge, I mean, it's not a huge population, but it's a suburb of D.C., so it's not particularly modest. Um, so it, the numbers were, were showing that there's a, there's a huge problem with getting um, getting young voters to actually vote. And is this uh, transferring interest of like teachers and teaching bringing it into is. the curriculum? We're um, well, we're working with uh, teachers from Rockville, Maryland, to um, to look into passing a similar um, similar law in Rockville. Now um, Maryland has a lot. Maryland cities have a lot of control over their elections, which is great for Maryland um, cities because. Cities can often be, you know, laboratories of democracies well, where the new policies can spring up that are really innovative. Um, but what we do um, as a program is basically depending on, you know, what group is coming to us with interest for a specific policy, um, we will like, look into the, uh, the laws of that particular city to see if, you know, if the, what they want to pass is possible. For example, Baltimore was working with us and they were very interested in um, same day registration, um, they were very interested in early voting and various um, items that they had ceded their elections um, to the state. So um, they're fairly limited. They have the capacity to pass a right to vote resolution, which would basically um, affirm a, you know, a positive um, voting stance by the city and spur conversation about voting. However, it, it, they have very little capacity to pass um, ordinances. <coughs> Uh, I, I wanted to say that, uh, and thank you so much for being here because she came up from Maryland. <laughs> and the way that we found Fair Vote is through one of our committee members, Jane Callis, uh, who had called a meeting. Uh, and since she's not able to always come to these meetings, she called a meeting at her home and had them come from Maryland to her home. We go where we need them. To introduce uh, me to them, and because she wanted them to come and to talk before our committee here, so that was, I thought that was important for our committee members to know. Also, we met with Mr. Ritchie, uh, and I believe he's been in conversation with Assemblyman Kavanaugh's office, uh, and has been advising him as well. Uh, I do know one last thing, and I'm not sure if you are, are prepared to speak on this, but he wanted to create a model because he, he liked the kind of work that we're doing and have been doing, and wants to be able to create a model where it is nationwide, so best practices could be shared, so it would be an easier way to find out about what's happening and what's working in other areas. I can speak to that. Um, so what we're interested in doing is um, we want to promote a participation network where um, cities that pass right to vote resolutions or pro-voting ordinances, they set up um, committees or task forces that basically have a similar role as the um, Voter Assistance Advisory Committee where they will look into electoral processes and procedures and propose or suggest um, best practices um, and also propose or suggest um, pro-voting ordinances. And what's so great about this is, like, we've already gotten interest from um, from various cities in um, California or in Maryland, or you know, we've we've had a, a decent amount of interest since the uh, Tacoma Park resolution was passed. But what we want to do is basically create an infrastructure where there are um, or there are these committees all around the United States. So when um, one um, one city is interested in doing something that's good for voting, they can reach out to a um, committee in another city and say, how did you pass this? What were the steps that you took? Um, and that way, we really just want to promote a conversation about like good ideas. You know, the democracy is not one size fits all. Um, a lot of things, um, a lot of policies can really help particular communities. And we are interested in tailoring elections to um, to basically create the most voter engagement possible in various communities. Um, and we think that um, creating an infrastructure is one of the best ways to do that. 
Thank you very much. Thank you. Yes, so I'll bring up uh, Mr. Pauline and Ms. to speak. Basically, we're trying to empower young people in terms of providing them, better, better preparing them for housing as they transition from foster care to independent living. We found that um, with our supportive housing partner, as well as our NYCHA partner, which are the two primary sources of housing that young people eventually end up in. We have other sources, but because of the income requirements, they often uh, are not able to afford those uh, other housing. We find that they were not very prepared. So um, in, in trying to bridge that gap, we created a collaborative and I'm overseeing that. And I thought it very important that we actually include voting as a key component for young people for them to become empowered. Um, one of our modules that we do is entitled Empowerment versus Entitlement. Um, we know a lot of our young people have the entitlement mentality that you know um, public assistance is what they're going to be the default and NYCHA. We're trying to change all of that. Uh, in so doing, I invited Cheyenne to come and have a conversation with our young people. You can you hear me? Have a conversation with our young people. <clears throat> and to that end, um, at the end, um, I like to have a practical takeaway where our young people actually make a connection between what empowerment is um, versus entitlement and have something practical to see. Um, Cheyenne was very dynamic, very engaging when she came and she spoke to us. And she, I know one of the conversations we had that was really sparked a lot of uh, robust debate was over stop and frisk. And we had all, you know, it was very intense. But um, we also broke it down to them and I said, you know, our program is recommended, we highly recommend that they complete a series of sessions in order to become better prepared. And you get a lot of pushback, as you can imagine, from the young people. So uh, while Cheyenne was presenting, we sort of like double teamed, if you will, and said to them, well, you're in foster care. Who makes a decision about my standing here and having this conversation with you? It's the commissioner, right? And I said, well, who appoints the commissioner? You know, the mayor, right? <laughs> he said, so how does the mayor get elected? Mm -hmm. And I said, most of you will eventually end up in NYCHA housing. We're trying to change that. But, you know, for the, in the foreseeable future, most of you in NYCHA housing or supportive housing, who would you like to see chairman to NYCHA? Mission to NYCHA, to put it housing. And so when you put it from that perspective, I think young people began to see that there's an inextricable connection between trying to empower them and where voting, you know, actually makes sense. And I'm happy to report that, you know, in the first cycle that we had 22 people involved and all of them actually registered to vote after. Um, in our second cycle, Shine came and we were too shy, you know, <laughs> just too shy of having 100%, and I'm working on those two <laughs> you know, we, we eventually will have these trainings, um, they're ongoing, uh, and each time we have a session on entitlement versus empowerment, you can be rest assured that I will invite Cheyenne to come. <laughs> so now until September or November when we have elections through primary and election seasons, um, I will try to increase as much as I can the tar turnout that we get for each session so that you'll get a uh, broader and a more robust number of people actually registering to vote from uh, that whole part of government. I want to ask you a question. How many of those young people own phones? Oh, practically all of them. <laughs> <laughs> all of them do. They have smartphones. All of them do. Yeah. Okay, perfect. I'm yeah. just passing that on. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so we, we, do, we do collect the information, so, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Well, you're welcome. Any questions? Well, when you open empowerment, let me know and I'll bring my kids. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. And when I turned 18, I voted and I've never stopped voting since. So I think yeah. Yeah. Vanderbilt YMCA. 
Um, I'm a case manager for um, teenagers up at, um, at Vanguard High School. We work off-site full-time um, within the high school. Um, and we've sort of built a sort of infrastructure up on the fifth floor where um, all of the teens can come see us and we do one-on-one -on -one case managing, but then we also offer youth programming after school, um, two of which are actually civic engagement related. We do youth in government with our teens and then we do Teens Take the City, um, in which they go up to Albany for youth in government and they go to City Hall for Teens Take the City. And the, the, our students are working really hard um, in these programs or have been working really hard in these programs. Um, a majority of the students that we work with up at Vanguard are um, come from uh, specific socioeconomic backgrounds um, in which if these programs weren't in place, uh, the resources that they are being provided, they wouldn't be receiving. Um, and so we, we truly were so grateful when Cheyenne um, came to do the workshop with us because many of our students had been exposed to different forms of civic engagement and this gave them an outlet to see how much they know and how much is left for them to learn, but then also um, approach it, like learning gets to be fun, I guess. And so it was really beautiful to see um, our teens just light up uh, during the workshop, during um, during Cheyenne, like telling them the facts about voting. Um, many of our students, some of them were already on point, they knew, knew some of it, and some of it they were just in complete shock. Um, staff included, myself included, some of those statistics were crazy. Um, and so for us, it was really uh, having this form of uh, workshop um, with our students was a great um, outlet for us to really just show, really teach for, at first in a, how would I put it, in a very um, engaging manner, um, in the language that students understand, like we had swag. Um, so she was throwing um, like all this swag, and it was like, Oprah, you get a car, you get a car. <laughs> and like my students, they just were, they, they were so engaged. And I, I'm not lying when I say days after, they kept coming up to me and were like, we loved that workshop. And we learned so much. And so it was just really beautiful um, as someone who leads workshop with youth as well to really just see a different approach and to see how they're really um, learning so much in a way that they're not even understanding they're learning. Like, because it's happening so fast and it's so much fun. And like, they have, I mean, Cheyenne can attest they had like 15 bracelets. It became a competition <laughs> between my teens um, and questions the next day about voting. Um, and the best part was that the teens that she was speaking to, some of them were 17, some of them were 18, some of them were 16. So it really was great to, to sort of plant the seed early um, and and see the curiosity develop over time. Um, yeah. <coughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> from the New York Institute of Technology. Hello, everyone. My name is Rosalie Amanino. I'm the Assistant Director of Experiential Education at New York Institute of Technology. And uh, we've been working now with New York City Votes for about a year. And last year, we had some members of the Fabulous Street team come and train us the camera right over there. Um, and it was actually very much needed because I, I invited other members of our campus life and student activities and residential and housing life to, to attend because they work so much with our college, you know, with our students. And I felt we all needed to be educated about the voter registration process, which is a bit complicated, but I think we got the hang of it. And um, we set a goal for ourselves uh, just before the academic year last summer for 700 new uh, newly registered voters between the two New York campuses. So we're based on Long Island as well as in New York City and then all throughout the world actually. So um, there are global campuses. 
but we ended up getting uh, pretty close to that goal. We registered 513 students, which we were very excited about. Um, and we found to, the most effective strategy was to get them early at, um, during the orientation process. So that's what we're definitely gonna be focusing on again this year. Um, but we're also looking to do some things that are a little bit more creative. We certainly wanna involve social media. So when China came in for a uh, refresher voter registration training, thank you, um, we talked a little bit about how we can engage our students um, in more creative ways. And with all the, especially the mayoral candidates um, that are running there, so many and it's hard to really process all that information and our students oftentimes would just say to us well you know we're busy we don't have time or the dreaded i hate politics um which was you know a challenge but we um we try to engage them try to ask them questions and i think you know uh, just relating to what the candidates are actually representing is important so we we thought you know it would be kind of interesting to have students summarize the candidates' platforms over video and then posting that on our different social media platforms. So they're kind of getting their friends involved and you know, look at me, I'm on camera. And then hopefully that will actually educate them as well as the candidates that are running. So that was one idea that we had, we're hoping to pilot this fall, um, as well as just canvassing, getting out to our students. So setting up a table and wondering why they're not coming to us was you know, a question we had last year. And then I would just encourage the students that work in our community service center to you know, actually sit down with the students and talk to them. Once they did that, there was a, a huge turnaround. Mm -hmm. um, so from the first t day that we tabled where we got zero voter, you know, new um, students to register to the next time where it went up by like you know, 50%. So they saw a big difference. So I think the individualistic approach is really important for our students um, as well as collaborating with different staff and faculty who um, you know, probably don't feel like they can talk to students about their political beliefs, but we're trying to encourage them, you know, we're trying to encourage a civic engagement culture at NYT, and it starts with our faculty and staff. So you know, campus conversations, um, workshops, trainings, and then just you know, canvassing and setting up um, pop-up voter registration campaigns all throughout the campus. And you know, it's challenging in Manhattan because we have such few free space or such limited free space. But you know, we're hoping to just get them early and then you know, especially trying to work with some of the upperclassmen who might have missed that initial intake and just engaging them and getting their thoughts. Uh, so we have a few ideas, but we stay, um, you know, we're really fortunate to be working with the Campaign Finance Board and with New York City Votes who have just been instrumental. This is not a new initiative at NYT, but it's definitely been revived. So the 513 voters, that's probably the most that they've had in at least 10 years. So it was exciting to see, and we're hoping to get even more this, this year. Thank you. And finally, from Lehman High School, Chancellor Green. Hi, how are you? Good evening, everyone. Hello. Hello. I am uh, proud to say I'm finishing my 25th year at Herbert H. Lehman High School my 32nd year in Department of Education. Uh, and, uh, you know, I'm sitting here dumbstruck uh, because, of, you know, I'm looking at the location. I'm a teaching American history historian, and uh, we spent a lot of time talking about the 1862 draft rights, where uh, the people who could vote, massacred those who could not. And that's not lost in the classroom these days. Uh, we have a coalition of teaching American history historians throughout the city who are focusing on New York City as a critical lens in the development of this country. And so, you know, I want to thank uh, <coughs> you all for having me come here today mm -hmm. to speak to you about the importance of voter registration. Obviously, as a high school teacher, uh, it's very, very important for me to impart upon my students the need for civic awareness and public engagement. Um, I kind of know why the Department of Education draws a line as to how far they'll go in this particular process because basically it means their job. And that should be lost on, on the challenge to reach out to, uh, to youngsters. But the importance of, of empowering young people uh, is so great at a particular time when they're beginning to apply for college, when they're beginning to apply for a job, and to exercise their constitutional right to vote. And so uh, I, I met uh, Sabrina here about two years ago, and we did a, uh, a session at Lehman College where we invited some students. And you know, 
not many of my students left the building to come over there. So I, you know, I've come to realize after 25 years that when you're going to do something, you have to take it right to the, to the house. You have to bring it to the schools. And so we look at the senior year for high school students. Senior year is the time for participation in government classes, and it's the time for economics in the second half. And so we invited Cheyenne to the school where she came in and she held 35 high school students every session, absolutely spellbound. And as you, as you pointed out, you learn things when Cheyenne speaks that you never knew before. And I'm a teacher, okay? <laughs> a social studies teacher. But when it comes to looking at New York City as a critical lens, there's so many things about this city that we still are learning even today. And so she came in and she did a senior assembly back in September, early October, where she was talking to 800 students. And then we invited her back into the classroom where she did her presentation. And her presentation was engaging, it was empowering, a lot of kids learned that day, <coughs> as did the teachers. And so one of the things that I said to Cheyenne, you know, coming back, we brought her back a second time this year, I said, you know what, economics, voter registration, you know, there's, there's some connection here. Let's go back and revisit the classroom, which is when we did the survey. And I think the survey was very, very revealing as to a struck a chord amongst the young people in the city that stop and frisk is still a critical issue in their minds at the forefront, particularly this time of year. And so I said to her that, you know, every year uh, we begin the year by having a 9-11 memorial assembly. I am by trade a coordinator of student activities. Uh, there is a coordinator of student activities in every New York City high school. There's a coordinator of student activities in every high school in the country. And therefore, you know, we look to empower our students, again, making them civically aware, publicly engaged through a volunteer program. And to me, that's always the greatest research you could ever have when you're dealing with high school students, is the actual students themselves, empowering them by giving them the opportunity to volunteer and make a difference. Getting back to Cheyenne, so when she brought those important issues, you know, I had to point out, well, you know what? This is a, not a presidential year. And in presidential years, generally the, the interest swells, okay? Obviously the last two presidential ele elections were unprecedented in that uh, Barack Obama won both. And so once the presidential election comes and goes, interest begins to wane. And so I said, you know what? We have to start early. Because if you look at it from September 1st to the first Tuesday in November, is a very small window. Again, considering that they are beginning their senior year, they're applying for college, they're applying for jobs, they're applying to vote, so you have to hit them fast and hit them hard. The first Wednesday of the school year is usually our 9-11 Memorial Assembly, and we look at it as a focal point, a springboard, if you will, to get these kids involved. So she's gonna come back and she's going to address the crowd, and she's going to get them involved, and we're gonna give them a voter election form right then and there. Let me come outside the building for a minute. Uh, at one point in time in New York City, public schools, there used to be an Office of Student Affairs. And coordinators of student activities, again, in every high school, used to meet borough-wide and uh, also city-wide twice a year. And so in the Bronx, we still hold those meetings. We don't hold them as often as we'd like to, but we still hold those meetings. Coordinators of student activities do everything that comes out of the classroom that is extra and co-curricular. By co-curricular, I mean these are the program where students are applying the skills that they acquire in the classroom to real-world experiences. So when we talk about getting together next year, one of the things that Cheyenne's going to be able to do is she'll be able to talk to every COSA in the Bronx at one time when we have our annual meeting, which is the, we're looking ahead. But again, that's not until the end of September, and we, at that particular point in time, have about five weeks to get it running. In the schools, what we do is to take advantage of that particular point in time, not just for the students in the participation in government classes, we also have student council elections. So student council elections, those students who wish to participate in school governance will have an opportunity to serve campaigns. And the building becomes alive because they put their posters up and it's all about them. But that's a great connection for them to understand the importance of becoming involved, taking a leadership role, and, and, and then the parallels to what is going on for the first time in this town in 12 years. Okay, so 
it's very, very important to me to, uh, to be here today. And I wanted to bring up a couple of resources that, that, that we use in the schools. You may have heard of some of them. Uh, the National Student Parent Mock Election has an online voting platform, which is administered by the uh, Women's League of Voters, and also sponsored by all the editors in the country of the newspapers. A uh, lady named Gloria Kirshner runs it out of Schenectady, New York, I believe. There's also a platform on the University of Virginia website called the Youth Leadership Institute, where they have an online platform that identifies mostly from national candidates, but also if you put in your zip code, it tells you who is running in that particular election in that area and what their issues are. And of course, as far as curriculum is concerned, most of the American history teachers and the uh, participation in government teachers and economics use iCivics.com. So those are some areas you may want to look at to get some, uh, to glean some understanding. One of the things that I did uh, this year is we put, download a lot of PSAs from YouTube. A lot of uh, political statements are out there. Not, uh, not just political statements, but statements that support certain causes. For instance, one of the biggest issues, that uh, biggest uh, problems that we have is the March for Babies, uh, which raises money to fund the pre-neonatal intensive care units in our local hospitals. We also give to Penny Office. We also give to uh, the AIDS Walk. And so a lot of the materials on, the, on YouTube are available, or school too, are available for just that they already exist. But we take it a bit further in our school, where if you go to our website at LehmanHS.com, you can see Lehman TV, where the students create their own videos, the supervision of the teacher, and then they create videos, which you can go on and they do their public, uh, their public service announcements. I think we won uh, the Dr. Phil one at one particular point in time. If you know anything about Lehman High School, you know that this is the first time in five years that the future of Lehman High School is no longer in doubt. So this particular graduating cohort has had to go through three different principles, four different paradigm shifts. And as you can see, you know, our students are very, very successful despite all that because kids are resilient. Kids bounce back. Kids, you know, can take it. And they can, you know, they roll with the punches and for the most part, they never give up. And so for, 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 for me to be here to say to you, to this body, that in the next six months, what I'm going to be doing is pushing to my colleagues that they need to get kids to register to vote. They need to do it not only for the kids, because they're going to be a part of the city for many, many years to come, but they have been a part of this school system for the last 12 years, and they're moving on into a state university and private colleges in the state, and they need to know exactly what the impact is, okay, over the last 12 years, and as they move forward, to take their place as participating members of society. And so I want to thank you guys for being here. Um, I just also want to point out, by way of suggestion, that, uh, again, there is a lot of political pressure when you deal with kids in terms of uh, who should they vote for. Well, I'm not here to tell you who to vote for. I'm just here to tell you that it's important for you to exercise your constitutional right to vote. Um, as it pertains to college and career readiness, we have to look at the fact that many students will be going to school where their financial aid is going to be cut down, okay? And in terms of what they're going to do, and this is the biggest part for me as an activity advisor, the students have to play an active role in this process. It's not a one-shot deal. It doesn't come and go after the first Tuesday in November. It, they must become civically engaged, and volunteering is the thing. Now, from what I understand, students as young as 16 years old can sign up to be a poll taker? Is that right? Is that right? No? no? no. How old do you have to be to work in a election? It's 18 years old. Okay, well, then, here's the population. So this is a way for them to get engaged. And even if they don't get paid, you can volunteer anyway. Okay? COSAs, coordinator student activities, can help you in that regard. And again, I thank you for allowing me to come here today. Uh, right now, it's uh, one building, 3,000 students in one school, 500 students in another school, and 200 students in another school, and we're getting two more schools. So it's a real crowded place. <laughs> <laughs> well, the bell rings, you become the wall. <laughs> <laughs> Where it's gone as high as 5,000.
Yeah. And how many of them are 17, 18? Yes. Well, we have the number one YABC program in the school, in the city, uh -huh. which means the kids who don't graduate from Lehman attend the YABC program, and which also has a GED. So uh, I don't know if this conversation was going to continue, but I was going to recommend that you reach out to YABC directors. Right. Uh, I know my director would love to come and speak to you. Um, Mr. Martin Smorkel. He's very close, he's very proactive, and uh, you know, he also uh, administers the local GED program in the building. So we run from 7 o'clock in the morning till 9.30 at night. Right. You know, it's over 125% utilization, so it's a big place with a lot of things going on. Yeah. Do, your student, do your students have smartphones? <laughs> if, they, if they do, they get confiscated. Uh, they can't have them in the building. They can't have them in the building. Right. But just sort of anecdotally, just among the student body, what would you say? I would say most of them have, uh, yeah. I think and that's how they get Well, there's a truck outside. <laughs> there's a truck outside, a couple of houses that converted their house fronts into store windows where the kids can drop off their phone for a dollar. There's a truck <laughs> every day. Okay. I'd love to have the concession, by the way. Because, you know, so it's, what a fundraiser. But then again, you can't. You know, right? Otherwise, they get confiscated. We have boxes and boxes of phones, smart and otherwise. And get left behind because they can tools. You know, there's not going to be another phone. I don't know if I'm going to buy it. You know, but yeah, we have the technology is there. We're, we're a school that's wired, and the infrastructure is definitely there. The kids have to get their job. Okay. Yeah. Do you have like because you have a beacon program? Or do you just, you know, just the beacon programs? You know, the I believe the beacon may be tied to the GED program there. Okay. Uh, but it's administered by the YABC director. Yeah. Okay. And so, that's another place we should try. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. So um, now we're going to uh, have a presentation. Uh, Jeff Mara, who is our representative from the public uh, public active Bill Palacio's office, is going to uh, issue a proclamation. Okay. Uh, first, I want to thank everybody who came in today. It, it, for those of you who don't go to that many government meetings, this is not a typical government meeting. You don't see this level of enthusiasm and energy and really innovation. And I think that's a testament to all of you here as well as uh, the members of AC and the staff. Uh, there's really, it, there's something exceptional that's happening here with VAC. And I want to take a moment to just recognize our chair Art Chang for his leadership. Uh, Art took over at VAC a uh, little over two years ago and he came on board with some very big ambitious ideas and uh, many of us who work in government were always cautiously optimistic when we hear big ideas because government is one of those places where ideas oftentimes come to die and where ambitious leadership often falters in the face of bureaucracy. So uh, I'm going to present uh, Art with a just a as small sort of uh, token of recognition yeah. uh, from our public advocate, Bill Blasio. Says, whereas a great city is only as great as those individuals and organizations who perform exemplary service on behalf of their community, and whereas on April 13, 2011, Art Chang was appointed chair of the Voter Assistance Advisory Committee by Mayor Michael Bloomberg, and whereas as chair of Back, Art Chang established an ambitious vision to make New York City a model for 21st century democracy by leveraging the power of technology to build a digital public square that links formal democratic process directly to existing social networks. And whereas over the course of the past two years, Art Chang has brought together a selfless team of partners in New York City's nonprofit and technology communities to make this vision a reality creating a unique mobile platform to help more New Yorkers take an active role in city elections. Resolve that I, public advocate for the city of New York, Bill de Blasio, recognize Art Chang as a citizen worthy of our highest respect and esteem, and may it further be resolved that today, June 17, 2013, is a day to honor Art Chang's achievements and celebrate the upcoming launch of the NYC Votes mobile platform. Well, I, I just want to say that um, I, I kind of tend to be somebody who actually does things, but it's actually a little embarrassing to be honored like this. Um, but thank you very much. Um, and I think part of the embarrassment, and I just want to be very clear about this, is that you know you you get a you have the privilege of 
of occupying a particular point in time. And um, when you swim upstream, it's very difficult and you really can't achieve anything. But when you are swimming with the stream, and then it's possible to really to make amazing things happen. And um, as one fish swimming with the stream here, um, we're kind of have this unique moment in time where everybody is focusing on this and where we sit in the middle of a city that has a very progressive view toward um, campaigns and voting and we sit in the middle of an agency that has amazing staff and amazing leadership without whom this really wouldn't any of the things that I've been working on would never have come to fruition so I just want you to know that I, I, I don't accept this but it's really on behalf of all the other people who've made this possible. So, um, uh, the next item on our agenda is uh, a performance by one of our youth poet ambassadors. Um, I'm sorry, she you said your name. So we have one of the Youth Poet Ambassadors from our Youth Poet Laureate program that we do in partnership with um, Urban Word. This year is the fifth year of the program and we'll have the final slam um, to commemorate the fifth year of the program at Lincoln Center on October 17th. So we're really excited about that. So this is Catherine George. Uh, she attends Brooklyn College and she's a theater major. Uh, she did a wonderful poem last year about voting and civics. So we'll hear it now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I just want to thank you guys for having me. Um, I've never been to an event like this. Um, and just being around you guys have, you know, inspired me to, to kind of take some initiative to learn some more about how I can um, help the youth um, in my community to, you know, establish this important right that we have. Um, the Youth Poeter, the Youth Poet um, Voter Program just allowed me to, you know, find strength within myself to um, be exposed to something different, something new. I am a first generation um, Dominican. Um, and so for me, you know, my parents were, the first time that I voted, my parents were right behind me in the booth like, Go, 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 you do it again. You gotta make sure that you do this, you know? Um, and I was definitely excited because of them, but it was also because of the program. And as was mentioned, um, you know, throughout this entire meeting, um, this youth poet, um, this youth voter poet program comes to us. It comes to the youth who enjoy literacy, who enjoy poetry, spoken word, slam. You know, they set up a slam, you know, to kind of put the, the edge in us a little bit as a competition and the, the prize is a, is a book, you know, and uh, to be a published author, that's, that's absolutely phenomenal. Um, so I just wanted to say, you know, thank you guys, thank Cheyenne um, for, you know, as was mentioned before, bringing the fire to us as opposed to us trying to, you know, have to find it. Um, so this is my one minute photo piece. There is a tree being hacked on your street corner by those who have made a game out of destroying things. Its branches living in poverty, naked, shivering, lamenting all the parts of it that have been stolen by those in power. There is a painter conjuring a tree onto a blank canvas whose leaves become a multicolored sea plentiful enough for any human to thrive in. Do not be the tree. Influenced by ignorance, full of uncertainty, swaying in a dance going left to right. It only knows how to fall and fail. Do not be the branch. History shows it has never had the power to hold on to anything long enough to save it. Be the painter. You have the power to paint the picture you want to see. The world is your canvas. Pick up the brush and paint. Pick up the pen and vote. Thank you. So now as we do at the end of every meeting, we have an opportunity for public comment. So anyone who would like to uh, give public comment, I welcome you to come and join us. Okay. Okay. 
So with that, um, may I have a motion to adjourn? Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.